All right, welcome to class. We're going to uh, look at today's uh, lesson on evaluation, kind of continuing our theme there. Um, what we want to talk about today uh, is really kind of a, there's a three-pronged kind of model, if you will, for evaluation. Um, and so keep in mind what we're wanting is, you know, to evaluate a company, to be able to, um, to, be able to look at their financial paperwork and, and know what the company is all about. And so I'm giving you some different models and some things to think about so that you'll be a little more comfortable when you look at the financial paperwork of a company of knowing what areas are important and what areas are not. Um, so in this model, uh, there are three kind of areas to look at. One is uh, asset valuation. The second one is uh, earnings power. And the third one is profitable growth. And we talked about in the last video that not all growth is profitable, right? Um, so we'll take each one of these in, in turn, uh, but these are the three components of the model. So I'll give it to you one more time. Asset valuation, right? And asset valuation is really, you know, looking at the number of assets that you have, um, and determining a dollar value or a, a worth of the assets of the company. So that's what we're going to look at here in just a minute. Um, and then you have earnings power, right, which is the company's ability to, uh, to maintain their earnings, to, to be able to earn um, an income. And, and we'll look at, at what creates earnings power. We're going to talk about uh, having a, uh, a competitive advantage, right, uh, because if, if what you do can be done by everyone else, um, then your earnings are not as, um, as guaranteed, right, if you will. Um, and so they're on a little more shakier ground because competition can emerge much easier. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. And then uh, profitable growth um, is another thing that, you know, so these three things you would want to look at. What are their total assets? What is their capacity to earn, right? Are they set up well to earn uh, an income? And then are they efficient enough so that as they grow, it's profitable, right? So we're going to look at the first one in this video, and we're going to look at asset valuation. Okay. So one of the keys uh, to asset valuation is you would want to look at uh, the balance sheet, right? The balance sheet is one of the, the key accounting forms, right? Balance sheet, income statement, cash flow analysis, um, and statement of retained earnings are kind of your four kind of core accounting forms. Um, and on the balance sheet, it tends to balance, right? That's where you get the name, between assets and liabilities, right? So if you're going to evaluate a company based on their assets, this balance sheet is where you're going to turn to, right? Because that's where it's got the listing of all of the assets, it's got the listing of all of the liabilities, and you're able to go in there and get a snapshot of the company, right? Uh, you know, the income statement doesn't tell you about all of these things, right? So there's, um, there's uh, machinery, uh, plants, you know, in terms of manufacturing plant, uh, property, buildings, um, inventory, things like that, that would be included in the balance sheet that you wouldn't see necessarily on an income sheet. So if you look at the income sheet, it's going to tell you how much money came in over a given period of time, right? But it's not going to tell you other things about the company's assets, like their property and their machinery and that type of stuff. Um, so. You're going to go to the balance sheet, and then the balance sheet, right, as we talked about, balances between two different things, right? You've got your assets, and then you've got liabilities, All right? So liabilities are things that you owe. Assets are things that you own, right? So liabilities are things that cost you money. Um, assets 
are things that make you money, right? Okay. So, um, or that you could make money off of the sale of, right? So inventory, right, uh, makes money off of its sale. Uh, this is why some people, uh, that definition of asset versus liability, that liabilities cost you money, assets make you money, is why many people, there's a little bit of a discussion, and I, I won't get into this too much, but just seed for thought, about whether your home is an asset or a liability. Because if you were to look at all of your bills, you would most likely find that over the course of, say if you're in your home for 10 years, that over the course of that 10 years, your home cost you more than it made. Even if it allowed you to, you had a little bit of appreciation, the value of your home went up some, um, and then you know, you're gonna build up some equity. Even with all of that, you've got so many operating costs you know, electric, insurance, you know, other utilities, internet, phone, television, repair costs, uh, yard maintenance, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff, furniture to go in it, appliances. I mean, there's a lot of operating costs associated with home ownership. And so even though a home, um, is a necessity, right? It is not necessarily the big asset that people talk about. If you just give a strict definition that assets make you money and liabilities do not, um, then uh, then you could make a case that a home is more of a liability because there are so many costs associated with it um, that even if you build up equity and even if you um, you know, and, and by the way, equity is not profit, right? Equity is just what you have left over after interest. So even if you build up equity, that's not really, you know, a lot of people, they pay monthly into their home, and then when they sell it, they've got, say, $50,000 left over, and they say, oh, look what my house made me. The house didn't make you that. You made that with your job, and you paid that on your mortgage, and so your equity is not really profit. Your equity is just what was left over from your monthly payments, right? Uh, so the only profit from the home would be appreciation, right? And uh, if, you know, if, if you remember anything that's happened from 2007 to 2012, you realize that 90% of homes depreciated in value during that time. Um, and so if you were buying your home thinking that it's an asset, if you had it during that time, not only did you have all of the costs associated with your home, uh, the, the one part that you thought might have been an asset would have been the appreciation. It means the house value went up over time, um, but it didn't, it went down. And so, you know, it, it just something to think about that, that home ownership is important. I think it adds to the stability of your family. Um, it's, it's better than, you know, uh, in many ways than an apartment long term. Um, you know, so there is some, there's some value there because at least you're building up some equity. The trouble with an apartment is your, your costs are a little lower, um, but your equity is zero in most cases. You know, every once in a while they have some kind of a savings plan or something, but for the most part, equity is zero. So if your house payment is 1200 a month and your apartment is 800 it's it's a little bit lower, but over time, uh, at least some of your 1200 is going back into principal, and you can kind of you know, if you stay in it long enough, you can build up a little more equity, whereas in the apartments, there's none. So, so home ownership is important. It's good for the stability of your family. It's good uh, overall. But that doesn't mean that it's an asset, right? Uh, so anyways, it's, uh, if, if you just go by that strict definition that assets are things that make you money and homes uh, and, and liabilities, rather, are things that cost you money, then your home, if you, if you just look at it that way, you look at all the costs that come with owning a home, and you look at the fact that the only way to make any money on the home is with appreciation, and that's not very well guaranteed. I mean, from 2007 to 2012, everything went down, and so that's, that's a losing proposition there. And then statistically, over the years, even though home prices appreciate, uh, it's only kept up with inflation, right? 
only been about average with the rate of inflation over the years, other than that one, you know, six-year bubble that the economy went through where real estate prices skyrocketed and then crashed back down to reality. If you just look at the real estate prices over, you know, the last hundred years, they've pretty much appreciated at about the same rate as inflation, which means that if it's going up at the same rate of inflation, that the money that you make at the end off the appreciation wasn't really any earnings. It's just, it's just, you know, keeping up with inflation, right? It wasn't actual profit. Um, so anyways, uh, it's just the difference of, of, of how much your house is worth now versus then is, is not actual profit, even though it is kind of. It's just, it's just the fact that the price of everything has gone up a little bit, and so your home will have some value. So, but if you were to subtract operating costs out of your appreciation, Right. If you subtract, if you add up all your utilities, and you add up all your internet and home phone and insurance and lawn maintenance and appliances, furniture, everything that is associated with home ownership, and subtract it out of your appreciation, you'll realize that that, that situation was actually a a negative uh, in terms of cash flow. Uh, anyway, that's just some side things. Hopefully, that illustration will help you think. If I, if I can give you illustrations to help connect sometimes with some of these concepts, it helps this to sink in even better, right? Um, so you have assets and liabilities within any organization, right? And so the idea is, theoretically, that if you could add up all of a company's assets and subtract all of their liabilities, that that would give you an asset value, a net asset value. Because to just add up only the assets doesn't really give the full picture, right? Just like when you look at the house, if all you do is look at the appreciation of the home, then you'd say, oh, wow, look at that. That's, that's a very good asset. It's a value. But you've got to subtract the liability part, too, right? To, you know, let me give you an example. If a company has $500,000 in assets, you look at that, you say, wow, that's a good company. But if they have $2 million in debt, does that change your perception? $500,000 isn't looking too good here because you've got so much debt. In fact, most of their assets, they still haven't paid for yet, you know, because they, they took it out. Uh, you know, they, they, maybe they bought this building on debt. And so, yeah, it's, it's you know, the majority of their stuff is still over here in liability. It's not an asset form yet. Uh, they're still paying off the building, right? So anyways, just looking at one side or the other doesn't tell the whole story, right? And so, and you, you could do the same thing. If I put the 500000 in liabilities and you just looked at that, you say, man, that company is $500,000 in debt. They must be tanking. And then you, but if you look at, wow, in assets they have $2 million, then all of a sudden that 500000 in debt seems manageable. Right, they got two million in the bank. It's, it's it's not that big of a deal. It's just some operating debt that they've accumulated to help grow the company, right? And so the idea is that the the full snapshot has to be there of both assets and liabilities to understand the picture, right? Because in, until you understand how much that you have of the other, you don't know if if that's good or not. You know, five hundred thousand seems good unless unless you've got two million dollars in debt, you know. Uh, 500000 in debt seems awful to, to most people uh, in, unless you're a millionaire in your assets and then it's, it's not that big of a deal. So in other words, in order to understand uh, the assets, you have to know the liabilities and vice versa. You need both of these to get a snapshot of the, the health of the company, right? So you call this um, net assets. Just like net profit is the profit after operating costs and cost of goods sold. Your net assets are the assets you have left over once you subtract your liabilities, right? So it gives you net assets. And that's really the, the better picture, right, of, of the company's health, is what do they have once you subtract the liabilities, right? That's the real value of the company, okay? Um, and so in order to do this, you need to be able to assess both sides of this, right? Uh, you need to be able to look at uh, where the company's assets are, where their liabilities are, and all of this is on the balance sheet. And so 
I also want to talk just for a second about just strictly coming up with some some asset numbers for um, uh, for looking at you know when you're looking at the balance sheet, you're looking at your assets. There's some things you want to think about because not everything that comes up on the balance sheet would be something that you if you know if you're investing in the company that you would maybe want to include, right? Um, for instance. Uh, goodwill, right? You can put that legally in a in a balance sheet, right? Uh, like your good name or something. You know that stands for something. Um, for example, Coca Cola, right? Uh, their brand, their bottling, uh, their logo, just the name Coca Cola itself carries weight with it, right? And so that actually has some value. Um, and so, you know, and so that's why they have that in there, that you can put some things like goodwill and, and brand and things like that that you can incorporate into your balance sheet. Uh, but if you're talking about just, just strictly a financial investment, you may not want to include that. Because why? Because it's very subjective, right? There, there is no real objective, clear-cut way to say how much Coke's brand name is worth. I mean, who's, who's coming up with that? Now, they're just guessing. They're estimating, right? Maybe it's a logical guess, but it's still just a guess about what the brand is actually worth, right? And so if you're talking about making an investment, you probably want to keep it more to, like, hard assets, right? Things like cash, things like inventory, things like buildings and machinery, uh, things like that that you can, you can look at that if, if the company ever went bankrupt, you could turn around and sell it. If Coke goes bankrupt, you're not going to get a whole much from their brand name, right? Because their company is no longer exists. You know, and every once in a while you can do. I've seen some instances with cars, where say if a car, uh, Rolls Royce, is an example. Um, it's got a very storied history. You know, Rolls Royce. When you hear that, you think top of the line car. Um, but you know, they ended up. Uh, uh, selling out to BMW, right? And so, uh, and it was a whole big thing because somehow the brand got separated from the car, and so one competitor bought the car and the manufacturing and all of that, but BMW bought the name. And so now BMW is the one that owns the rights to the name. Uh, Rolls Royce and the other company had a lot of the other assets and things, but but now any Rolls Royce that you were to buy would be coming from BMW because they bought the name itself. So here, this company is is dissolving and getting rid of its assets, and it sold the car part <laughs> to one company, but they sold the name to someone else. Um, so that's an example of, of sometimes a company could be going down, but yet because the name is so famous. Uh, somebody else snatches it up and starts producing in that name and, and taking it, uh, you know, like a company like BMW that has all kinds of assets could come in, buy the name Rolls Royce, start producing Rolls Royces, and all of a sudden have that top level quality and the financial assets behind it to keep the company profitable. Um, but so, but but not every company is that way. You know, Bob's Hamburgers down the road or something. If you're wanting to buy that business, and he says, "Oh, I've got fifty thousand dollars in my brand name. I'm the only Bob's Burgers in town," um, that may or may not be worth anything, you know. Uh, you know, so that's why, just from a strictly financial point of view, you, you want to stick to things that you can be clear about the value, right? All right. So a couple other things to think about when you're uh, valuing assets is that there is a difference between Reproduction costs or you could call that replacement versus liquidation costs. Right. Okay. So reproduction versus liquidation. Liquidation 
like if you ever heard of liquidation sales at manufacturing warehouses, things like that, um, basically what they're saying is we got to get rid of things or going out of business or whatever, and we're selling them, you know, but whatever we can get for them. That's a liquidation cost. So an example of a liquidation cost might be, go back to our classic example, of VHS manufacturers, right? They, they were at the height of their game for, for many years. They were, they were a booming industry, right? Uh, if you wanted to record something, it had to be VHS. And they, they dominated the market, made a lot of money. Uh, then they lost a lot of money when DVDs and CDs came out, particularly because many of the companies that produced the VHS were not the companies that produced the DVDs. Uh, many times they, they pushed the new technology away instead of buying it up and making sure that they were positioned to be the next thing, they, they pushed these people away, and then they started their own companies and put them out of business. Uh, and so as these VHS companies are going out of business, nobody needs a VHS producing factory anymore. So you're not going to get a high dollar market cost on that. You're going to get a liquidation cost, right? Just whatever you can get for it. You know? They're not going to give you much. They're not going to give you what you paid for it. Because when, when you're paying for a VHS factory, it's in the beginning. And there's still all that money to be made. And so they're going to charge you a lot of money to put this factory together and all this stuff, and you're willing to pay for it because you see how many VHSs you're about to sell. But on the other side of it, as the industry is dying, then all of a sudden that equipment loses a lot of its value. Right. Reproduction or replacement costs would be, say if you, if you were right in the middle of the VHS boom. Sales are still very high. Everything's healthy. Nobody's even thinking about DVDs yet and you wanted to produce another warehouse, right? Uh, then you're not going to get it here. You're not going to get it at liquidation costs. You're going to have to pay full price for your new factory, right? So the idea is that depending on the industry and the health of the industry, you will either want to select a liquidation price analysis or a reproduction price analysis, right? So if if you're trying to evaluate a company like a VHS company and you're looking at their balance sheet and you're seeing all their factories, you're going to say, what is the liquidation value? What, what would we get if we just sold this stuff? Because we're not going to get full dollar for it. Versus if you're trying to evaluate Apple and they're producing iPads and they're producing iPhones and that stuff's still very, very relevant and you're looking at Apple's balance sheet because their stuff is still very relevant you wouldn't, you wouldn't value it down here. You, you need to give a value currently of the company up here at replacement cost because if you were to try and get, uh, buy these factories from Apple, they wouldn't sell it to you for pennies on the dollar because it's still making tons of money. So they're going to sell it to you at top dollar replacement costs, right? Because it's still producing a lot of cash. Um, and so depending on where the industry is, you will evaluate a company slightly different. So if it's a dying industry, or if the company itself is bankrupt, right, then everybody's going to know, well, they're, not gonna, they're, they're probably not going to get top dollar for some of this stuff. Some of their stuff they might. Um, if, it's a, you know, if it's a machine that can be used by somebody else, say if the industry is still booming and a particular company dies and their equipment can still be used by somebody else, then they'll probably get top dollar for that. Their, um, maybe some of their other stuff, their brand, their logo, um, their, their, maybe their actual products that they made from the dying company, like their inventory, right? They've already made a whole bunch, but their company is dying. Their inventory may not have 100% value, right? Because the company's dead anymore. Who wants to buy something from a company that doesn't exist? If it's broken, you can't take it back, right? So if the company's going bankrupt, their machines might still have top dollar value if the industry itself is still booming, right? So if, it, if there was some company that came out and they were producing uh, a, a, some, a similar product to iPad, some other tablet, but they just couldn't quite compete with iPad and they tank, right? They, they go bankrupt. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, uh, but they may have some machinery, some production machinery that Apple could use. And so Apple might buy that machinery from them, or some other tablet company could buy that machinery from them, and they'd still probably get pretty good top dollar. But then they've got 20 pallets of tablets that they haven't sold yet, 
um, that they probably won't get top dollar for that because nobody, their company is no longer in existence. Nobody's going to want those. They can probably get something for them, but not top dollar. So when you're going through and evaluating a company, the, the context of things determines how you value their assets. So just in a normal situation, you would just do, you know, replacement cost. What, what they would pay for it right now, right? Um, but there are some situations where you can't just look at how much that stuff costs. You have to look at um, the fact that, that nobody hardly is going to want that stuff anymore and it's going to be, you know, highly discounted uh, if you're going to get anything at all, right? Um, so if, if you were evaluating the VHS company, and they tell you, oh, oh, we've got $10 million factories. You may have to step in and say, hey, yeah, but, but we can't give you $10 million and value the, your company with that $10 million because we know that your industry is dying. Those factories really aren't worth anything because pretty soon nobody's going to be buying VHS. So those, those factories, yeah, you paid $10 million for them, but they're not worth $10 million anymore, right? So that's, that's something important to remember. So when you're looking at a company, um, there are two different types of assets. Uh, maybe even a third that you could throw in there, but uh, the first one would be current assets, right? So if you remember from your accounting stuff, current assets are things that you could get your money back in in like less than a year, right? So cash is a current asset, right? Um, cash turns into cash very quickly, um, so so no problems there. Um, your accounts receivable, so that's that's people that uh, that owe you money, right? Um, so you've you've sold them something and they're making payments to you or, or they're you know they, they still owe you some money on something that you've done some kind of service you've done for them something like that that's your accounts receivable money you're still receiving in accounts payable is what you owe to other people and so accounts receivable when you're looking at the balance sheet that has value it may not have 100 percent value so if you look at their at their balance sheet it says they have a million dollars in accounts receivable common sense ought to tell you they're probably not going to get 100% of that back. Nobody, I mean, no company gets 100% back on that stuff. There's always somebody that loses a job, can't make their payments for a while. Uh, you know, so whatever your accounts receivable is, you, if you're evaluating the company, you may want to put a certain discount on that. You may say, all right, we'll give, we'll value that at 85% because chances are 15% of those payments are never going to come in. People lose jobs. Uh, people spend more than they should have. Um, you know, people go to jail. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that happens that that causes people um, to not be able to pay their payments. Sometimes they spend so much on their credit cards that the payments just pile up, and they they got to start cutting back on something. Um, and and maybe your your payment that is one, the one they cut back. Sometimes people get sick, and their medical bills skyrocket, and so now they're trying to keep up with that, keep buying their medicine and the credit card bills or whatever just doesn't get paid. You know, so, so there's, there's different reasons. So when you're looking at the balance sheet and you look at assets, cash, you don't need to discount, right? Uh, but accounts receivable, you might want to say only give 85% of that. And then on inventory, depending on the situation, you may want to discount that down to 50% or you may want to leave it high. If, it's, if it was Apple and you're looking at their inventory of iPads, probably don't need to discount that because you know, those will eventually sell. Uh, they may not sell at, at current market value, but at some point, you're going to get something out of those. So you could maybe discount those maybe just to say 85%. But if it's the company that was making tablets that was competing with Apple and they go bankrupt, those tablets, you might have to discount you know, 75%. Uh, of the of the market value on those because who wants to pay even half price for a tablet that is from a company that's bankrupt anymore and you could never you could never get it fixed you could never replace it if it doesn't work um, and then it's probably not as good as the iPad otherwise they might not have gone bankrupt right so there's so anyway so you're gonna have some real issues um, and the fact that they're gonna have a hard time selling those probably because they're bankrupt so they don't have any marketing dollars Right, so if you were evaluating that company, you may discount their inventory by 75% or something. Um, so typically, no company is going to get 100% of their inventory sold at top dollar. So when you're evaluating them, you might 
want to, to do a 15% discount on their inventory because even if they're selling through them quite a bit, uh, chances are that they're not going to sell them 100% at top dollar. Uh, there's going to be a return somewhere. Somebody's not going to be happy with it. Somebody's going to want their money back. Um, you know, something's going to happen. There could be a product defect or sales that happen. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so, so whenever you're looking at inventory, understand the number they're giving you is if they sell all of them at top dollar. Typically, that's not going to happen. And if, it, and if, they, if they've made their own adjustments in there, then, then they should explain that somewhere and let you know uh, this is, you know, 85% um, of inventory at top dollar because we know certain things come up, right? Whatever. So those are kind of your current assets. Uh, raw materials, um, you know, those would just be whatever the going rate is. So if it's steel, you know, steel can be used anywhere. Uh, just whatever the current going rate of steel is, that's what you would value that at. And then you have uh, non-current assets, your long-term assets. These are things that um, would be uh, that you don't expect to turn into cash over the next year. Your machinery, your manufacturing plants, your buildings, uh, your vehicles, all of that kind of stuff uh, would go into that. But that's still part of the value of the company, right? Um, you know that what separates Bob's Burgers from McDonald's is not the recipe. It's the real estate, right? Uh, that McDonald's has thousands of real estate locations. Bob's Burgers has one, right? And so Bob's Burgers could have a better burger, right? There's a lot of places that have better burgers than McDonald's, but there's very few places that have the real estate that McDonald's has. So when you're evaluating McDonald's, um, you know the the real estate, the non-current assets are huge, right? It's their, it's their locations, it's their buildings that have built that company. Um, and so, uh, and, you know, and their, their machinery that they have in there, their, their warehouse uh, networks of getting all the food and being able to cook everything quick, their system, all of those things are non-current assets that are really important to the value of the company, right? So when you're, when you're looking at an evaluation of assets, you want to have an awareness of current assets and understand that they won't all sell at 100% of value except for cash right? and then you have your non-current assets all your buildings and things for the most part those you can look at what is the going rate you know you can get a real estate appraisal something like that um, maybe discount it a little bit because very rarely do you get whatever you ask for in real estate and that's a very hot market most of the time you get it down just a little bit, five, ten percent below asking price, um, and then um, the only place where you would maybe really want to discount something is if there was a reason that that factory or whatever is no longer all that valuable, right? So the VHS factory, for example, um, that may be a ten million dollar factory, but you can't give it a value of that because whoever buys it is not going to use it as a VHS factory. They're going to have to completely remodel and all that kind of stuff, so it's not going to sell at what they bought it for. Uh, if you have a, a chemical manufacturing plant that, that manufactures a certain specific chemical for a product, that goes out of business, the chances of the person wanting to come in who's buying this property, of, of them having the exact same business and needing to produce this exact same chemical, are probably low, right? Uh, they may like the location, they may like some of the equipment, but the chances are they're doing something else with this equipment. And so some of it's going to get scrapped, some of it's going to have to get remodeled. There's going to be a lot of cost for them, which means what they're going to be willing to pay for it is going to be a little bit lower, right? So you use a little bit of common sense if you're doing these evaluations, right? And so these are, are some good common sense principles um, that you should know for looking at other businesses and looking at your own. Right? So that when you're looking at your own balance sheet and you're looking at your inventory, you don't make your projections in the future based on selling 100% of your inventory at top dollar because it doesn't happen that way most of the time. Right? And so you have to be realistic with yourself as well. So you're looking at your own small business and you see your inventory and when you're trying to figure out how much you can spend on salaries and marketing, discount your inventory a little bit. Right? Go with 85% of the market value of your inventory so that you're not caught off guard.
right? And so those types of things. So how you would evaluate another company, and you say, well, I wouldn't give you top dollar for that inventory because it's not all going to sell, is how you need to look at your own company as well. And you learn to get that objective viewpoint of your own company so that you can manage it more properly, okay? So the main thing to get out of this lesson is that what you're after is net assets. Once you've gone through some of these steps, looked at your current and your non-current, and I said there's possibly a third, that's when you get into the subjective things, the third cat, so you have current assets, which is cash, accounts receivable, non-current assets, property, facilities, that kind of stuff. The third one would be subjective things, like the brand, image, uh, goodwill in the community, uh, perhaps the the skill of your employees, right? If, if, if your employees are the only people that know how to do a particular thing, then that's kind of an advantage there. That's kind of there's some value. But in terms of investing, it's hard to really put a number on that. It's kind of a subjective thing. So, so there is a third category of asset, but it's all those subjective assets that, that you just kind of have to guess on those. There's not a real rock solid number like how you have with your current assets and your non-current. Um, and then after that, then you would subtract all your liabilities, right? And that gives you a net asset figure. Um, and that's really uh, one of the key numbers then of looking at the company. And then you have to pair that with the other two things that we talked about, which we'll go into uh, in other videos, which is the earnings power, right? And then can you do profitable growth, right? Um, because it's one thing to have a lot of assets, but if you have a whole bunch of assets and you're not really earning anything, uh, then those assets are just sitting there. You could have a, a multi-million dollar facility and not have multi-million dollar sales and net profit, right? Just because you've got put it, sunk a bunch of money into assets doesn't mean you've been able to turn it into profit yet. And so this is just being able to evaluate assets is just one step in evaluating the company as a whole. But it is important because, you know, uh, if, you know, all things being equal, uh, having a whole bunch of assets is, is a strength. It's a foundation for the company and it makes their earnings uh, much more stable. If you've got high earnings and no assets, that's not as stable as high earnings and high assets, right? So this is not the only piece of the equation, but it's an important first step. Because you need to know, is this company, even if they're profitable, um, you know, what, uh, what types of assets. So this is the first step. Go through, evaluate the assets. And then once you have that number in hand, that tells you a little bit about the company now. Now you can say, okay, when everything's said and done, I've subtracted all my liabilities, I have a net asset number. And then that tells me quite a bit about the company. And then we're going to take that and combine that with the earnings power. Um, that we're going to do in the next video, and it gives you a real good snapshot of the health of a company, okay?